Okay, we're going to start this lecture by teaching you about substitution reactions of epoxides. As you might remember from chapter 4, if I take an alkene, such as the one shown here, and treat it with this type of molecule called a peroxy acid, what it does is it converts the alkene into this three-membered ring that contains an oxygen, which is called an epoxide. Now there is, of course, another way of making epoxides as well. If I have an alkene, and I convert it into this type of molecule, which is called a halohydrin, as we've discussed in a previous chapter. If the halogen and the OH are trans to each other, then I can react it with a base, such as hydroxide, and that base will strip the proton off of this oxygen, giving me an O-. Assuming these are trans to each other, once again, this O- can come in here SN2 style, form a bond with this carbon, and kick off the chloride in one fell swoop, giving me this product, which is also an epoxide. Now, if these two groups are cis to each other, that cannot proceed, because as we've learned in our earlier chapter, SN2 mechanisms have to involve the nucleophile attacking from the back side. And this indeed is an SN2 reaction. It's just an SN2 in which both the nucleophile, this O-, and the leaving group, this chlorine, are on the same molecule. With that said, let's throw this problem at you. Please draw the product of the following reaction. Step one, I treat this cyclopentene with chlorine and water, and step two, I hit it with hydroxide. I'm of course going to show you the answer momentarily, but you're welcome to pause this and see if you can figure it out on your own. Here's the answer. As we should remember from an earlier chapter, if I take this alkene and treat it with chlorine and H2O, what it ends up giving me is this product, in which the chlorine and the OH are trans to each other. I will also form the enantiomer of this product as well. If I treat this with base, then this base will strip the proton off of this OH, giving me an O-. Then the O- will cyclize down here, form a bond with this carbon, and kick off a chloride in one fell swoop, SN2 style, to give me this product, which is an epoxide. So as it turns out, there are additional reactions that epoxides can do. If, for example, I take an epoxide, like this boring-looking epoxide here, and treat it with an acid such as HBr, the lone pair electrons on this oxygen can push down and form a bond with that hydrogen, kicking off the bromide in one step to give me a positively charged intermediate. At this point, the bromide can attack one of those two carbons, and in this case it doesn't matter which one, pushing these two electrons right here into this oxygen to neutralize its charge, and then give me this product, in which I have both a Br and an OH attached to this ethane linker. Okay, let me show you another example, just so that we can get our feet under ourselves a little bit. I've got this epoxide right here, interacting with any type of acidic proton attached to some generic base B. You know, this B plus is not supposed to be boron. This is just a symbol meaning any type of positively charged generic base that has an acidic proton. The lone pair electrons on the oxygen can reach up, form a bond with that hydrogen, push these electrons into the base to neutralize its positive charge, and give me this positively charged intermediate. If I then introduce any type of nucleophile, such as an alcohol, for instance, you can imagine the lone pair electrons on this alcohol's oxygen thrusting in here and forming a bond with one of those two carbons while pushing the electrons shared by this carbonous oxygen up and into this oxygen to neutralize its charge. When that occurs, it gives us this intermediate. As this base then comes and grabs this proton and pumps these electrons into this oxygen to neutralize its charge, we end up with this type of product in which I have an OH on one carbon and an OCH3 on the other. Now, I highly recommend before going on that you take a close look at the starting material, the reagents added, and the product so that you can see very distinctly where everything came from and where everything ended up. Now I'm going to show you more reactions of epoxides, but before doing so I need to stress something. The epoxide opening attack, that is the step where the nucleophile comes in and opens up the ring, always occurs anti, which gives trans products. For instance, if I took this epoxide and treated it with acid, the oxygen would get protonated to give me an OH plus right here, and then my water nucleophile would come in. As it comes into this lower carbon and pushes these electrons up into this oxygen, it has to come from the back side. 
after it gets deprotonated and thereby neutralized, I end up getting these two H's being trans to each other. And now some more nuances. As it turns out, if I do an epoxide opening reaction, the product that I get can be different depending on whether or not I do it under acidic conditions or basic conditions. Let me show that to you here. If I've got this example, and this is an epoxide that is asymmetric, the oxygen lone pair electrons are going to come out, form a bond with this hydrogen to give me this protonated intermediate. At this stage, you'll notice that if I'm reacting this molecule with any type of alcohol, this R group here is just so, supposed to be a generic hydrocarbon chain, the lone pairs on this oxygen could theoretically attack and form a bond with the carbon here at the left or the carbon here at the right. Which of the two carbons is it going to bond with? Well, keep in mind that because this oxygen is positively charged, it's going to be slightly hogging the electrons here or pulling them towards itself. That gives both of these carbons some partial positive charge. Which of the two carbons do you think is going to have the stronger partial positive charge? Well, of course the answer is the carbon at the left. And the reason is because that would give me a partial secondary carbocation, whereas the carbon at the right would give me a partial primary carbocation, which is less stable. Thus, when this alcohol nucleophile comes in, it's going to attack the carbon at the left, forming a bond with it and pumping these electrons up and into this oxygen to neutralize its charge. That gives me this intermediate. At this point, a second molecule of alcohol, which is presumably our solvent, will come and grab that proton, pumping these electrons into the oxygen to neutralize its charge and forming this product. This is the product that I would get under acidic conditions. Remember then that under acidic conditions, the nucleophile opposite the epoxide attacks the carbon that forms the more stable carbocation. In this case, a secondary carbocation. Now by comparison, under basic conditions, we see something different. Under basic conditions, I have my epoxide and there's no proton anywhere to protonate it. Instead, what occurs is my nucleophile is just going to directly attack it SN2 style. Now, if you're a hot alkoxide nucleophile, are you going to attack the carbon at the left or the carbon at the right? Well, as you can imagine, it's much easier to attack the carbon at the right because it is not flanked by an additional carbon getting in the way. Thus, under basic conditions, the attacking nucleophile attacks the less substituted carbon and pumps these electrons into that oxygen, giving me this negatively charged intermediate. This negative charge eventually gets protonated, traditionally by another molecule of alcohol, to give me this product. Please note that under basic conditions, the nucleophile and the OH end up on carbons opposite to where they end up under acidic conditions. If you want to see why, please go back to the previous slide and review. So let's summarize this section. If I've got an asymmetric epoxide and I treat it under acidic conditions, the nucleophile will attack the more substituted carbon. And the reason is because that has the more stable partial positive charge. Under basic conditions, the nucleophile attacks the less substituted carbon because it's less congested and easier to get in there. Let's see if we can solidify this concept by looking at some problems. Show me the products for each of the following reactions. Now, as I am going to show you the answers in the next slides, you're welcome to pause this right now and attempt it on your own, if you wish, before going on. Here's our first example. It's been treated under acidic conditions. So, of course, in the first step, the lone pair electrons come out, form a bond with that proton to give me this protonated intermediate. You'll notice that I have a partial positive charge building on the carbon up top and the carbon down bottom. Which of those two positive charges is more stable? Of course, it's the one at bottom because that is a tertiary carbocation versus a primary carbocation up top. Thus, what occurs next is these electrons thrust up and into the oxygen to neutralize that charge, giving me this tertiary carbocation. At this stage, my nucleophile, in this case, my methanol solvent, will come in, form a bond at that position to give me this intermediate. A second molecule of methanol will now reach down grab that proton and pump the electrons into that oxygen to neutralize its charge, giving me my final product, in which the OCH3, or methoxy group, is stuck to the internal carbon and the OH is on the external carbon. In our second example, I have the same starting material, B 
being treated by methoxide. These are basic conditions. There's no H plus around. On the contrary, I've got a source of strong alkoxide base. Now, at this point, this negatively charged oxygen could attack this carbon right here that's more substituted or the carbon up top. Which is it going to do? Of course it's going to attack the carbon up top because it's less encroached and easier to get in there. Thus, this methoxide comes in here, forms a bond with this carbon, and pumps these two electrons up onto that oxygen to give me this intermediate. At this stage, a molecule of solvent, methanol in this case, that has a proton that can be removed, will provide it by having this O- attack it, pump the electrons up onto the OCH3, and give me this product. You'll note, contrasting this product with the one from the previous slide, that this product has the OH at the bottom and the OCH3, or methoxy group, at the top. Once again, illustrating the difference between epoxide ring opening under acidic versus basic conditions. So this seems like a wonderful place for us to stop. I hope you've had an enjoyable time. Please tune into our next videos in which I'll continue Chapter 10's coverage of very specific substitution and elimination reactions. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.